Greetings to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is a pleasure to be with you again today. I am Pastor Bestel. I am the, the uh, pastor of Calvary Lutheran Church, and uh, it's a privilege to be able to extend greetings to you uh, from uh, your brothers and sisters in Christ at Calvary. Uh, I'm also, I also serve as the current circuit visitor over uh, our particular circuit of congregations, uh, and, and I uh, certainly applaud the congregation's patience and faithfulness uh, as you uh, wait for the call process. I assure you the call committee is working very uh, diligently in this call process, but I know you've been very patient. Uh, God will send his pastor to you uh, when uh, uh, he is ready and according to his will and timing. So thank you for your ongoing patience and faithfulness during this, during this process. Uh, the only announcement that I've been asked to give you this evening is to let you know that a dear member of the congregation, Ann Smith, has died in Christ, and Ann's funeral will be this coming Wednesday. With that, then, we begin our service with the opening hymn. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Our help is in the name of the Lord, who made heaven and earth. If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness, therefore you are feared. Since we are gathered to hear God's word, call upon him in prayer and praise, and receive our Lord Jesus Christ in the fellowship of this altar. Let us first confess before God and one another that we have sinned in thought, word, and deed, and that though we cannot free ourselves from our sinful condition, neither do we capitulate to it. Together as his people, let us consider our transformation as saints and take refuge in the infinite mercy of God, our Heavenly Father, who assures us of his grace for the sake of Christ. Almighty God, have mercy upon us, forgive us our sins, and lead us to everlasting life. Amen. Almighty God, merciful Father, in holy baptism, you declared us to be your children and gathered us into your one holy church. 
in which you daily and richly forgive us our sins and grant us new life through your Spirit. Be in our midst, enliven our faith, and graciously receive our prayer and praise through your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Everlasting Father, source of every blessing, mercifully direct and govern us by your Holy Spirit, that we may complete the works you have prepared for us to do. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The Old Testament reading is from Numbers chapter 11. Now the ramble that was among the children of Israel had a strong craving, and the people of Israel also wept again and said, Oh, that we had meat to eat. We we remember the fish we ate in Egypt that cost nothing, the cucumbers, the melons, the leeks, the onions, and the garlic. But now our strength is dried up, and there is nothing at all but the manna to look at. Moses heard the people weeping throughout their clans, everyone at the door of his tent. And the anger of the Lord blazed hotly, and Moses was displeased. Moses said to the Lord, Why have you dealt ill with your servant? And why have I not found favor in your sight that you lay the burden of all of this people on me? Did I conceive all this people? Did I give them birth that you should say to me, carry them in your bosom as a nurse carries a nursing child to the land that you swore to give their fathers? Where am I to get meat to give to all these people? For they weep before me and say, give us meat that we may eat. I am not able to carry all of these people alone. The burden is too heavy for me. If you will treat me like this, kill me at once, if I find favor in your sight, that I may not see my wretchedness. Then the Lord said to Moses, Gather for me seventy men of the elders of Israel, whom you know to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them to the tent of the meeting, and let them take their stand there with you. So Moses went out and told the people the words of the Lord, and he gathered 70 men of the elders of the people and placed them around the tent. Then the Lord came down in the cloud and spoke to him and took some of the spirit that was on him and put him on the 70 elders. 
and as soon as the Spirit rested on them, they prophesied. But they did not continue doing it. Now two men remained in the camp, one named Eldad and the other named Medad, and the Spirit rested on them. They were among those registered, but they had not gone out to the tent, and so they prophesied in the camp. And a young man ran and told Moses, Eldad and Medad are prophesying in the camp. And Joshua, the son of Nun, the assistant of Moses from his youth, said, My Lord Moses, stop them. But Moses said to him, Are you jealous for my sake? Would that all the Lord's people were prophets, that the Lord would put his spirit on them. This is the word of the Lord. The epistle reading is from James chapter 5. Come now, you rich, weep and howl for the miseries that coming upon you. Your riches have rotten and your garments are moth-eaten. Your gold and silver have corroded and their corrosion will be evidence against you and will eat your flesh like fire. You have laid up treasure in the last days. Behold, the wages of the laborers who mowed your fields, which you kept back by fraud, are crying out against you, and the cries of the harvesters have reached the ears of the Lord of hosts. You have lived in the earth in luxury and in self-indulgence. You have fattened your hearts in the day of slaughter. You have condemned. You have murdered the righteous person. He does not resist you. Be patient, therefore, brothers, until the coming of the Lord. See how the farmers wait for the precious fruit of the earth, being patient about it until it receives the early and the late rains. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brothers, so that you may not be judged. Behold, the judge is standing at the door. As an example of suffering and the patience, brothers, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord. Behold, we consider those blessed who are remain steadfast. You have heard of the, steadfast, the steadfastness of Job, and you have seen the purpose of the Lord, how the Lord is compassionate and merciful. But above all, my brothers, do not swear, even by heaven or by earth or by any other oath, but let your yes be yes and your no be no, so that you may not fall under condemnation. Is anyone among you suffering? Let him pray. Is anyone cheerful? Let him sing praise. Is anyone among you sick? Let him call for the elders of the church and let them pray over him, anointing him with oil in the name of the Lord. And the prayer of faith will save the one who is sick and the Lord will raise him up. And if he has committed sins, he will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous person has great power as it is working. Elijah was a man with nature like ours, and he prayed fervently that it might not rain, and for three years and six months it did not rain on earth. Then he prayed again, and heaven gave rain, and the earth bore its fruit. My brothers, if anyone among you wonders from the truth and someone brings him back, let him know that whoever brings back a sinner from his wandering will save his soul from death and will cover a multitude of sins. This is the word of the Lord. Gospel according to St. Mark, the ninth chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. John said to Jesus, Teacher, we saw someone casting out demons in your name, and we tried to stop him because he was not following us. But Jesus said, Do not stop him, for no one who does a mighty work in my name will be able soon afterward to speak evil of me, for the one who is not against us is for us. For truly I say to you, whoever gives you a cup of water to drink because you belong to Christ will by no means lose his reward. Whoever causes one of these little ones who believe in me to sin, 
it would be better for him if a great millstone were hung around his neck and he were thrown into the sea. And if your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life crippled than with two hands to go to hell, to the unquenchable fire. And if your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. It is better for you to enter life lame than with two feet to be thrown into hell. And if your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. It is better for you to enter the kingdom of God with one eye than with two eyes to be thrown into hell, where, the, where their worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. For everyone will be salted with fire. Salt is good, but if the salt has lost its saltiness, how will you make it salty again? Have salt in yourselves and be at peace with one another. This is the gospel of the Lord. Thanks be to you, O Christ. Let us confess together the holy Christian faith through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. Our text, Jesus refocuses John's concern about those casting out demons, and he says, If your hand causes you to sin, cut it off. If your foot causes you to sin, cut it off. If your eye causes you to sin, tear it out. And why? How does Jesus conclude? What is his overarching concern? It is better to enter the kingdom of God dismembered than be thrown into hell. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, what is the greater danger? One attempting to cast out demons in defense of the church's little children, or one ignoring the sinful conduct of the church's little children? Conduct that entices them away from their life as the church's little children. 
That's the contemplation Jesus sets before us in today's text, isn't it? And when we consider that casting out demons could also be loosely interpreted as sort of a visual of what we now know as the forgiveness of sins, we might even ask, what is worse? One attempting too much authority to forgive sins of the church's little ones, or one ignoring the sins of the church's little ones? It's so easy and tempting for us to spend a lot of energy doing the righteous work of pointing out others out there who are, quote-unquote, not of us, and thus must be leading people astray. And honestly, because heterodoxy and poor preaching and teaching is so prevalent in our land, there is a time and place to point out where wrong teaching about sin and the forgiveness of sins will lead the church's little children astray. And yet, as Jesus says in our text, look in the mirror and you'll find one in danger of leading himself astray. As right as we are to be aware of imposters, we're equally wrong to not be aware of the imposter within, the old Adam in our own hearts and minds. After all, who is the greater imposter? The one who perhaps misguidedly seeks to do the work of God? So that John thumps his chest and says, I and my righteousness should cast him out? Or the one who seeks to replace and be God, which is really the entire goal of the imposter within? It's the latter one that is certainly the greater imposter. And yet that latter one lurks within each of us and imperils us, all the while distracting us with stroking of self-righteousness by comparing ourselves to those, quote, not of us. Where the Christian has every reason to be incensed by some of the horrible false doctrines and resulting immoralities championed in our society, the imposter within our heart keeps our attention constantly and deceptively focused on the chaos out there that we might justify or overlook or explain away the chaos that imposter old Adam is causing within. We've noted before the progression, I've noted it at least with my congregation there at Calvary, I would imagine that you've had opportunity to study it as well, the progression in thought that Jesus gives here from, from hand to foot to I. As Jesus speaks of disciplining each and even removing each if they cause us to sin. The hand might do the dirty work, but it's the foot that carries you to the occasion of sin. And the foot might carry you to the occasion of sin, but it's the eye as a window into the soul that first delights in the opportunity for sin. Sin that again praises old Adam and his imposter reign. Now the Christian might quickly say, but pastor, don't worry, Jesus died for our sins. That's true. He did. And he also taught you to cherish God's holy will. To be not your own people, led around by the imposter within, but the people of God. See, that's the point of this text, isn't it? Yes, Jesus died on the cross for us, but that's not exactly his focal point in this text. His focal point is the imposter within and wrestling against all of the members that wage war against us. And to that end, he gave you in baptism the new Adam to wrestle the old Adam that the old Adam might daily be drowned and die with all sins and evil desires, Luther's small catechism reminds us. We cannot see, in other words, we cannot see justification apart from sanctification, nor sanctification apart from justification. When Jesus appeals to the wrestlings of sanctification, the, the actual process of actually being made holy, we ought not dismiss such teaching by simply appealing to the cross and saying, don't worry, I've already been declared holy and therefore I don't care about being made holy. 
To say Jesus died for me and then follow the passions of your heart and eyes as carried out by feet and hands as if they are your Christ. To follow such passions is to follow a worse imposter than the one who seeks to act in the stead of Christ but without the authority of Christ. At least that one will try to point you to Christ. But your own imposter within will most certainly point you away from Christ will make a mockery of the cross and will entice you into all sorts of fleshly desires and licentiousness and amid it all self-righteousness that stubbornly defends itself against any call to repentance. This is the worst thing that can happen to children of God, at least when they are confused by a false prophet as the Galatians were. A trustworthy servant of the word can still appeal to them as Paul did. O foolish Galatians, who has bewitched you that you should follow a different gospel and not the gospel of Christ? Yes, that warning can be well received by the Christian. But when the imposter of old Adam's stubborn self-righteousness is allowed to take root within, he will poison and irritate his own ears, and cause them to itch and be closed to the outside word, as if the only soothing word comes from inside, from the old Adam himself. Or as I sometimes refer to him, the capital M, me. There is the one God that competes against Jesus Christ. Me. And thus the new Adam must not be enticed by, but must cut off old Adam's pointing to the cross as an excuse for lazy self-idolization. New Adam will not use justification, the declaration of forgiveness, as an excuse to not strive and wrestle in the daily life of sanctification. Instead, as St. Paul says in Romans 7, he will wrestle fiercely and daily in loving the holy law of God, agreeing that it, and not the will of old Adam, is noble and right. How does St. Paul say it? He says, now if I do what I do not want, I agree with God's law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells within me. And if we see that it is sin dwelling in us, then we will not delight in it. We will not let I, hand, foot carry it out but will wrestle fiercely and openly admit the reality of the struggle within, and we will repent in joy as one who delights in God's law. As St. Paul himself does when he says, quote, For I delight in the law of God in my inner being, but I see in my members another law waging war against the law of my mind. Now, if St. Paul speaks of our desire for God's good and holy law as a wrestling, St. John speaks of it a different way, and I want to focus our sermon on St. John because it's likely the same exact St. John who had tried to call down thunder from heaven, if you will, or tried to stop, at least, those who are trying to cast out demons. That same St. John, then, writes in his epistle, as a young disciple, he had tried to stop others by saying, he is not of us, We we are the righteous ones, but now... That same John, now much wiser and by divine inspiration of the Holy Spirit, speaks of our desire for God's good and holy law as an already completed victory, an established truth to which we ought hold not just those out there somewhere, but we ought hold ourselves. John's first epistle says it this way, By this we know that we have come to know him, if we keep his commandments. Whoever says, I know him, but does not keep his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. And again, John points out that we are not heaping new burdens on the Christian by telling him to resist hand, eye, and foot, but are simply living in the joy of the Christian as he is raised up by Christ to love God's holy law, John says, Beloved, I am writing to you no new commandment, but an old commandment that you had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. 
at the same time, it is a new commandment I am writing to you, which is true in him and in you. In other words, that commandment we formerly despised as, a, as an old commandment of death in Christ and in his cross. We now love and rejoice in that same commandment now as the holy will of God's life. It is a new commandment, John says, because the darkness is passing away and the true light is already shining. Indeed, friends, this reality that belongs to you, that belongs to the Christian, that you are saved by the same Christ who teaches you in a new light to love God's holy law, which in the darkness seemed an unloving oppressor, this reality is the reason for your joyful wrestling even against your capital M, me. It's the reason that you are not appalled by Christ's command to discard hand, foot, and eye if they would cause you to sin. For you know what Jesus is saying. Eternal life is so truthfully and eternally yours in Christ Jesus. It is too precious an eternal inheritance to toy with and risk and endanger on account of fleshly desires and worldly whims. And thus the Christian will joyfully wrestle, and that joyful wrestling will even be indication of your faith in your salvation. Again, St. John says it this way in his epistle, We know that everyone who has been born of God does not keep on sinning, does not make a habit of and embrace his sinning, does not say to the hand, eye, or foot, yes, let's just do it again. But he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. Notice that first that the Christian does not keep on sinning, but notice also your assurance and your safeguarding in your sanctification. Quote, he who was born of God protects him, and the evil one does not touch him. In other words, even in sanctification, our help is in the Christ who came from the Father. We all with Paul must admit our wrestling is imperfect. We confess it often, I, a poor, miserable sinner. We all must admit with St. John that our effort against sin is imperfect. But St. John comforts us and he says, my little children, notice the similarity to our text, when Jesus appeals to his little ones. Perhaps John had learned through all those years to love the little ones of Christ. My little children, he says, I write these words that you may not sin. That's the proper Christian intention and joy to overcome temptation, not to give in to it. But John goes on and he says, if you do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the Righteous One. Notice that even in the daily wrestling of sanctification, which is absolutely a natural byproduct of the new Adam, apart from which we are living a lie of the devil. But even in the daily wrestling of sanctification, our shield and our breastplate, remember in Ephesians 6 it talks about the breastplate of righteousness, but that breastplate is not your righteousness. It's Christ's righteousness. And therefore, our comfort is justification because of Christ's work on the cross. We have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. He is the propitiation for our sins, St. John says. Or as St. Paul says it, who will save me from this body of death? Thanks be to God through Jesus Christ. Thus, friends, it is no mere Lutheran tradition or as the world likes to see it, some hypocritical veneer of self-righteousness, nor simply a churchy act to praise the Lord and sing to his name. No, this is no hypocritical show of our righteousness but it is utter dependency upon the breastplate of his righteousness. Indeed, it's an extension of the act of repentance in which we despair of ourselves, call upon his name, and thereby, thereby launch a vicious attack upon the old Adam. For every time we repent and sing 
and call upon Christ, old Adam must take a back seat, and the capital M, me, must be subdued, and that old imposter does not have a firm grip in our heart. So then, the psalm that serves as the church's intro at this week instructs us this way, Praise the Lord, sing to his name. Praise the Lord, the Lord is good. Every time we acknowledge the Lord's goodness, do we not put down the old Adam imposter? Every time we praise the Lord, do we not deny old Adam's desire to praise the self? Every time we sing to the Lord's name, do we not cause capital M me to recoil within? Of course, such singing is no means of grace. It's no replacement for the word and the sacraments. Such praising is no means of forgiveness. If you ever view praise as the main point of worship, you have misunderstood Christ's theology of worship. The psalmist does not call us to praise the Lord and sing to his name as a self-defense mechanism and the source of our strength. The strength that we need for daily wrestling and the certainty of eternal life is provided by none other than the Savior himself. One more time from St. John, the same John who once, was, who once sought to wrestle with others but was refocused on Christ and refocused by Christ to his own hand, foot, and eye as the source of sin. That same John now appeals only to Christ when he says and concludes in his epistle this way, we know that the Son of God has come and has given us understanding so that we may know him who is true and we are in him who is true in his Son, Jesus Christ. Friends, because you are in Christ Jesus, how does John conclude? He admonishes you and he says, little children, keep yourselves from idols. So those are the last words of his epistle. Keep yourselves from idols. Consider that carefully. Little children, there's our text again. As Jesus says, whoever causes one of these little ones to sin, who are those little ones? Little children of the church, John says. Keep yourselves from idols. Keep yourselves from that idol of capital M, me, that imposter and antichrist that seeks control of your members and causes little ones to sin and to leave the faith. Keep yourselves from idols, and the true God will keep you in and restore in you the joy of the new Adam, the joy of your salvation. That new Adam, born of and sustained by the sacramental gifts and greatness of the second Adam, that by his means of grace you may be defended from all evil, spared from hell where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. And yes, you friends will be brought graciously by Christ to everlasting life. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We join in the prayer of the church. Let us pray for the whole church of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Heavenly Father, keep us from craving and weeping after what we no longer possess, but instead give us contentment in the daily bread you so graciously rain down upon us. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Cause your Holy Spirit to rest upon us and our pastors, that they may prophesy your word publicly and faithfully among us and we in turn may prophesy your word in our homes and vocations. Bless the work of our call committee and lead them to the pastor of your choosing. Give comfort and courage to the congregation of St. Paul Beecher, whose historic church burned down last week. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. 
O Lord, uphold Christian Barnhart and Brian Schlapko and all those who bear the sword, sword in our land, that sin and wickedness may be kept at bay and may we live peacefully lives in security. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Save and raise up those who are suffering or sick, especially Andy Hines, who is undergoing chemotherapy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Give comfort to all who grieve the death of loved ones, especially the fams of families of Ann Smith, Varlene Huffstetter, Trudy Schmidt, and Vernon Castine. And bless the memory of Roger Wilkinson to his family. Grant all of us peace in the face of our mortality, confident in the eternal life we have through the death and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. All these things and whatever else you know that we need, grant us, Father, for the sake of him who died and rose again and now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Lord, remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let us bless the Lord. Thanks be to God. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. Amen. Go in peace, serve the Lord. Thanks be to God.